And a very good morning to you. It is that time of the month, of course. It is the month of July. That means we have our very own resident medico, Dr. Clara Chu, of course, from Life Medical Center, is in the studios with us this morning. And, uh, of course, you know, talking about a massive, massive, uh, uh, I guess, a health concern for many women, obviously, in particular, this one is going to be centered at the ladies today, uh, the topic of ovarian cancer. And again, it is, a, it is a big one. So we've got quite a few things to get through this morning. So let's jump on in firstly. Dr. Clara, welcome back into the studios again. Yeah, thanks, Mick. Good to be back. Always good to see you in here. It's uh, it's definitely a time when I look forward to our, our little chats together. I think they, from some of the feedback I've been getting, uh, they are helping a lot of people out, which is absolutely amazing. So uh, this one will be another one of those uh, talks this morning. So again, we're jumping into the topic of ovarian cancer. So let's get into it. Uh, what is ovarian cancer? So ovarian cancer is a malignant tumour in one or both ovaries. So while there are many types of ovarian cancers, the three most common types are what we call epithelial types. So that's about 90% of cases. They come from the cells outside the ovary. There's the germ cell type, which is around 4% of cases that comes from cells which produce our eggs. Um, And then the rare stromal type Um, which comes from the supporting tissue within the ovary. Mm. So I know that's all very kind of like scientific, but it, you know, it's sometimes helpful to to go into those details for people. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, what age groups can be affected here with uh, ovarian cancer? Um, So while getting older is the biggest risk factor for developing ovarian cancer, it can happen in any age. So Mm. it's usually seen in women who've been through menopause and the average age of diagnosis in Australia is about 66. Right. So is just... Is there, a, is there a limit that you should look at an age-wise limit first when you think, oh, okay, maybe I should get myself checked out for ovarian cancer? Um, not really, mm-hmm. because they can happen at any age. Sure. So, you know, if anyone has symptoms that they're a bit concerned about, mm-hmm. um, I'm quite happy to, you know, as a GP, to get it all checked Check out. Check them out, absolutely. Yeah. So leading into this, I guess, now is what are the, uh, some of the signs and symptoms we should look out for? Look, so unfortunately, as with some of these kind of like um, gynecological um, malignancies, there's often no obvious sign of ovarian cancer, especially in the early stages. So that often doesn't sit well with women who are a bit anxious about their health. Um, But that's, you know, the reason why there's no symptoms is because our ovaries are buried deep in our pelvis. So they would have to become fairly large for you to notice that they've grown bigger. Right. Um, And so having said that, women with ovarian cancer can have other more nonspecific symptoms, which can be caused by more benign things. Um, So I've got a bit of a list here, you know, abdominal bloating, difficulty eating or feeling full quickly, Mm -hmm. um, needing to go to the toilet um, to pass urine more frequently or urgently, back abdominal or pelvic pain, constipation or diarrhea, um, menstrual irregularities, feeling tired, indigestion, pain during sexual intercourse, or unexplained weight loss or weight gain. So you can see there, like that list, it's pretty nonspecific. Yeah. You know, a lot of people can have those symptoms and actually not have ovarian cancer or may have other things going on. Um, so, if, but having said that, if you experience any of those symptoms or you've got concerns, go and visit your GP. Yeah, very, very important indeed. Now, how is it usually detected? Okay, so there's a number of tests that we can do. There is a blood test looking for um, a marker for ovarian cancer called CA125, which becomes elevated when ovarian cancer is present. Now, I get a lot of patients ask, well, if there's a blood test, why aren't we doing it more often? And that's because everything costs money. Not to say that lives don't cost money, but, you know, as a GP, we do have to be frugal with kind of how we're spending that money and how we're sort of, you know, investigating, um, you know, symptoms and things. Mm -hmm. And then there are scans. So that might be in the form of a pelvic ultrasound or a CT scan of the pelvis, both of which will be able to see whether the ovaries are of a normal size or Mm -hmm. not. And then you've got some patients who may end up being sent for a colonoscopy as well to make sure that the symptoms aren't caused by a bowel problem like a bowel cancer. Um, So all of these tests can show if there's any abnormalities, but really like to confirm it 100%, we need to take a biopsy of the ovary if it is enlarged to see whether it is an ovarian cancer or not. Sure. So what are the uh, some of the current treatment options available at the moment? Yeah, so the treatment for ovarian cancer depends on the type of ovarian cancer, um, the stage of the of the cancer at diagnosis, of course, whether the woman is past childbearing age and sure. whether they wish to have any more children, 
Um, is it the fault of a gene mm -hmm. that, you know, we discover that there's actually a cancer? Um, we look into, you know, the general health and fitness of the person. And obviously, you know, the patient relies heavily on the oncologist that look after them to decide what's the best, um, best way to manage it. Um, but most commonly, ovarian cancers treat it with surgery and chemotherapy, either on their own or in combination. So whether you've had surgery or chemotherapy first will depend on several factors, um, including the stage of the cancer at the time of diagnosis. And nowadays, you know, with cancer treatment, there's more and more um, new things that are coming out. And so some things that have come out recently are things like targeted drug therapy. And so that may be offered to you if you have certain genetic changes in your tumour. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where the biopsy can come in handy because then we've got a sample of the tissue. We can look for genetic markers and to see what's the most effective way to manage it. Um, or if you have an advanced cancer that can't be completely removed with surgery, um, you know, these targets at drug therapy might also um, be offered to you. Yeah, absolutely. Some uh, some big ones there. We are joined, of course, this morning where our resident medico, Dr. Clara Chu, is in the studios with us talking about ovarian cancer. We'll take a very short break and we will be back with some more on this uh, huge topic. Stay with us. And welcome back, of course. We are joined this morning here, Rima Brecky. We're our resident medico, Dr. Clara Chu, and today uh, a big topic too in women's health. It is ovarian cancer we're talking about today. And uh, Clara, what are the, uh, the statistics of women having ovarian cancer in Australia? So while ovarian cancer doesn't get as much publicity as breast cancer, which is obviously mm -hmm. kind of one of the biggest um, cancers or the most common cancers sure. in Australia, it's the eighth most common cancer in Australia. Um, so when I was researching into this topic, the stats varied from 1,300 to 1,800 of Australian women being diagnosed each year. Mm -hmm. So if we're to put it into the context of the Central Coast population, that's roughly 34 to 47 women living on the coast being diagnosed every year. Wow. So what are the risk factors involved? Yeah, so um, the risk factors that are associated with a high risk of developing ovarian cancer include a family history of ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. um, the risk of developing ovarian cancer is high if one or more blood relatives, such as a mother, a sister or a daughter, has had ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. um, there is a link with um, breast or bowel cancer as well, so if there's wow. a family history of that. Um, and then there are um, people who have a mutation. So there's several known um, genes mm -hmm. where if there's a mutation in that, that can cause um, ovarian cancer. So up to 15% of all cases of invasive ovarian cancer in of a mutated gene. So women who have an inherited mutation in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes um, have a substantially increased risk of ovarian and breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a... Um, a condition called Lynch syndrome um, that also increases the overall risk of ovarian cancer over a lifetime. Um, so, you know, other than genetics, there's things that we can't control like increasing age, medical conditions like endometriosis mm -hmm. can sometimes cause yep. it, um, extended use of hormone replacement therapy. So hormone wow. replacement therapy is very safe yep. provided that you're using it under medical supervision and that, you know, we, we, check on it for you at the appropriate times and sure. don't allow the women to um, use it for a prolonged number of years. Yeah. Um, tobacco smoking and obesity are also other things um, that increases the risk of ovarian cancer. Now, the good news is that there are some risk factors that reduce the risk of developing ovarian cancer. So uh, for those women who've had children, having children is protective. Um, the use of the oral contraceptive pill is also protective. And um, having your tubes tied has been shown to be oh, wow. protective. Um, and then there's also some risk factors where it's just not clear whether they affect the risk of ovarian cancer or sure. not. So they include things like diet, alcohol, um, aspirin, non-steroidal drugs. Um, and interestingly, talc. I'm not quite sure what the link is, but... I think I've actually seen that somewhere that's come out. Um, and you mean talcum powder? Yeah. I do remember seeing something about the report about that a while back, and it was a big thing in the US. I remember and I was like, wow, that's crazy because talcum powder is such a, a normal mm. part of life from being a baby yeah. right through to a lot of people still use it into their older age. So, yeah, it is, it is amazing to think that there is a link there. So, yeah. so basically, is it a lifestyle or genetic or, or a combination of the two? 
Yeah, okay. Great question. I know you love kind of like, you know, always asking about, you know, whether it's lifestyle, genetic, mm -hmm. you know, is there anything that we can change? So most cases of ovarian cancer are not caused by inherited genetic factors. Um, so these cancers are actually associated with mutations that are acquired during a person's lifetime. Mm -hmm. So and, and they don't cluster in families. Right. So while there is that small proportion, like the 15% that I mentioned that's caused by the gene or potentially caused by the gene, there, there's, it means that there's scope for everyone to change um, their lifestyle and sure. reduce their risk um, of developing these changes that, in their DNA that may lead to cancer. So the two main lifestyle factors that have been identified are tobacco smoking and being overweight. Mm -hmm. Now with smoking, I think the public health message is pretty clear. Quitting yes. is the best thing that you can do. Not only reduces your risk of developing ovarian cancer, but it also reduces your risk of developing other cancers mm -hmm. like lung cancer, and also other smoking-related sure. conditions. Now, as for being overweight, we've discussed this before, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm aware that as a GP, that it's something that a lot of people struggle with it. Um, so if any of your listeners would like to make some changes with their weight, I would recommend starting with cutting out processed foods, sure. which is mostly our discretionary foods or junk foods, right? Sure. Um, you know, things like your chips, your biscuits, your crackers, your lollies, your ice creams, your soft drinks. So, you know, and, and just being aware that sometimes processed foods can also be dressed up as healthy foods with comments on the packaging like no added sugar, no added salt, all natural ingredients. Right, they're right? the big traps right there. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure that everyone's seen that in the supermarket. Yep. So the thing that I teach my patients to do there is to read the list of ingredients on the back of the packaging. Sure. So if sugar is one of the first four or five ingredients, put it back on the shelf, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, we don't need that amount of sugar right. in the foods. Um, and also, if you don't understand the entire list of ingredients or you can't buy those ingredients individually in the supermarket and actually make it yourself, also put it back on the right. shelf. Now, the reason that we want to reduce the amount of processed foods we eat is because our bodies weren't designed for them. So, you know, our bodies, were, we're animals and our bodies are designed to eat things that grow from plants or things that come from animals. Sure. So we need to think more like, is this what my grandmother or great-grandmother would eat? Yeah. Is this what they would cook? Um, and so the analogy that I like to use here in terms of, you know, what we're eating is, um, you know, cars and fuel. So I think you would agree, Mick, that most of us, if not all of us, would only put the type of fuel in the car that is recommended by the manufacturer. Absolutely. Right? You're not going to get a high-end car like a Lamborghini and put your... Put E10 in it. Yeah, put E10 <laughs> yeah, in it, right? right? You know you know that that could damage the car. So while we as humans don't come with an instruction manual, it also seems to make sense to me that we shouldn't be putting the wrong types into our bodies. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and how much more precious are our bodies than cars? Right. So I've recently read that, you know, some research has come out to show that good health doesn't just come from eating healthy main meals. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of patients who say to me, Oh, but I eat really healthy. But when I ask them about, you know, how much discretionary foods do they sure. consume? It's always the snacking that gets them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So um, it, what, the, what those studies show is that it's equally important to reduce the processed foods in our diet. Yes. So in other words, if you eat healthy meals with lots of fruit and vegetables, but consume a lot of junk or processed food, you're actually negating the positive effects of having those health, healthy meals. Um, it's just as bad for you. Um, you know, and, and conversely, if you're not having, you know, healthy meals, but you're not eating junk food, mm -hmm. it, you know, the, the two are kind of similar. So it's not just about eating good, healthy meals for your main meals and lots of salads and things. It's also about thinking through, okay, am I putting other processed foods into right. my body? Um, and then food aside, there are other things that we can add to our lifestyle to um, get into a healthier weight range. So, you know, plenty of physical activity, getting enough sleep, managing our stress levels. Um, so, you know, that's a fair bit there, but that's hopefully a bit of useful information for your listeners to help reduce their risk of probably not just ovarian cancer, but lots of other, you know, common diseases and illnesses as well. Absolutely. Always a pleasure to have you in, uh, Clara, for, for this particular month and, of course, every other month. And again, guys, if you want to listen to this back, of course, you can jump onto Rima Replay as well and the podcasting section on the website. All of the interviews there that uh, we do here in the studios are on there. So you can jump on, just find the date and the time and everything, have a listen to them. And because there, you know, we, we have people like Dr. Clara on 
to help you guys out to to you know God has designed us to live I guess long and healthy lives mm, and that's exactly what we want to do we want to uh, be proactive and, uh, and making sure that we're looking after ourselves so that you know all the things that God's got for us we want to make sure that we fulfill them yeah. and, and have a great life Dr. Clara as always thank you so much for coming in this morning and uh, make sure you stick around we've got some more great stuff still to come this is Rima Brecky.